Play clock at five. Pass is intercepted at the goal line by Malcolm Butler. Yes, he did. He gives it to Henry. Quick snap. Breeze. Pass is incomplete. No flag. Fourth and goal. of the NFL season what did we learn what changed over the course of a week you know going from the opening week of the NFL season to now what there are some teams that are starting to stand out already there are some that are already starting to lead the way of the pack and then there's a uh, same thing go with some of these players too but then on the other side of the coin you got some of the teams that are already might be having to hit the panic alarm uh, the panic button there and then there's some players that already might be just um, wrapping up the season here or maybe trying to put it to bed as early as possible. There's a lot going on, man. And uh, and not only do we have a lot of really good performances to talk about, of course, our biggest winners and losers of the week. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you should have known that this was coming. The NFL taunting rule is so bad I mean huge surprise right huge surprise that this dumbass rule that no one wanted is not turning out well but uh, well well everyone's talking about it and so am I <laughs> between that you know the leaves in the AFC West right now tied for first place through the Raiders and the Broncos don't really think too many people saw this happening but are the contenders or just pretenders and how good are the Bucks at this point? I mean, possible MVP? Are they the best team in the league? Or are they overrated, possibly? Of course, we're going to take a look into that. And more, but ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us here at Fourth and Long. Of course, I'm your host, Ross Allen. And this is our NFL Week 2 breakdown. And like I said, we got a few things to get into today. But first off, Make sure, if you want to go for all your sports betting needs and prop betting needs, go on over to thrivefantasy.com today or download the app on the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store. And on deposits of $20 and up to $50, they will match you dollar for dollar just by using promo code fourth and long. Once again, that's thrivefantasy.com. And for anything fourth and long, make sure to go on over to our website, thefourthandlong.com. A lot of great stuff there. Had a recent interview drop for all you MMA fans. Undefeated local fighter here in Idaho. Invited to the gym. Had a great conversation. Man, that guy has a chip on his shoulder. And a brand new motivation that is hopefully going to propel him to 4 0 in his next fight here in October. Squirts that's Lean, Mean, Jared Melton. And you can find that at thefourthandlong.com slash MMA. But ladies and gentlemen, let, let's break into things here because we need to get through this and we need to get to this. First off, like like I want to do, let's uh, start the show off because we're positive here, you know, totally. Uh, I'm totally just not negative when it comes to anything that the NFL touches because Roger Goodell's a sorry sack of uh, crap and should be removed from them and put Peyton Manning in. But you know, I digress. Let's talk winners. First winner I want to tell you about is Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens as they get a huge win over the Kansas City Chiefs over on Sunday night football in what was a really solid game. And this was definitely a really good performance for Lamar Jackson. He had a back front flip into the end zone that wasn't taunting. That wasn't taunting. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm still on that. And most importantly, Lamar Jackson and the Ravens get their first win over Patrick Mahomes. It's not only their first one over Patrick Mahomes. That was Patrick Mahomes's. How many times are you going to say Patrick Mahomes in one sentence? But that was Patrick Mahomes's first loss in September of his career as a starter. Okay? That's tough. That's how you know these, this Chiefs team has been damn good. And Patrick Mahomes has been damn good. But the Ravens get a really good win at home. Especially after the disastrous game they had a week one there in Las Vegas. As speaking of Las Vegas, let's talk about our second winner here. 
And that's none other than the Raiders quarterback, Derek Carr. Because he might actually be the MVP favorite at the moment. He's up there with Kyler Murray. He's up there with Tom Brady right now because he's leading the league in passing yards with 817. He's looked as good as he ever has. The Ra He's one of the few reasons that the Raiders are actually really good right now. He's probably the only reason that they're 2-0 uh, specifically. Not, I mean, they have a talented roster, but they wouldn't be able to do anything if Derek Carr wasn't playing this well. He has 120 more yard passing yards than Kyler Murray at this point, who is Kyler Murray's, of course, second league in passing. He's tied for ninth in passing touchdowns, which doesn't sound great, but he has four, uh, three behind Kyler, five behind Brady. But, of course, more than touchdowns, he's been efficient. He hasn't had, he's only had one interception on the season. Kyler Murray has had three. Tom Brady has had one. And he is easily the most important player on that team. He's one of the most important players in the league right now. Will they be able to, will he be able to keep it up? We'll see and we'll talk about that. And then our last winner of the week is going to be a team that got a huge bounce back win over a solid team on the road, especially after getting blown out at home in week one. That is the Tennessee Titans because they moved to one and one. Avoid that. Oh, and two deficit. They uh, say at the top, they moved to the top of their division here, and it was really, it was really, really good. If you're a Tennessee Titans fan, because it wasn't Julio um, got into the game there, and to, um, excuse me, AJ Brown did do half bad. They're still struggling and and being disappointment, disappointing so far though. But. The offense line did better. Taylor Lewan definitely did better. It'd be hard to do worse than what he did in week one. And most importantly, the workhorse of the team, arguably the most one of the most important players in the league at this point, Derrick Henry, he gets back on track. He gets the train going again. He has 182 rushing yards in, in the, their game against the Seahawks with three touchdowns. And he had more yards in one carry in this game than he did all of week one. That's Derrick Henry for you. You can't keep that man down for long, and so the Titans fans had to be very, very happy with what they saw here. But moving on from our winners, let's hop into some losers. And speaking of losers, let's talk about the Jets and the Jags, man. Because, oh boy, they're in the, things are not looking good so far. Is a team, as a record, and at the quarterback position. Because, and let's, let's take it. A look at this because my first loser is the top two picks of the 2021 NFL draft. Of course, Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson. Trevor Lawrence in week two against the Denver Broncos threw for 118 yards, a touchdown, and two interceptions. One of those interceptions, I gotta say, I'll let the homer come out. I don't care. Patrick Sertan with arguably the best, inter I would say that was the best interception of the week. One of the best of the season so far. I mean, arguably the best of the season. And that was for his first interception of his career. And his first start of his career in the second game of his career was a fantastic over-the-shoulder sideline catch, man. You don't see very many defensive backs doing that. And that looked great, but I digress. And on the season, Trevor Lawrence now has 450 yards, four touchdowns, and five interceptions. On the other hand, you got Zach Wilson, who threw for 210 yards, no touchdowns, and four interceptions in week two. I think what, I think he was two of his first five um, passes. His first two attempts were intercepted, and his and he went two for five. And his three of his first five passes were picked off. Well. You know, his, through his first five passes, at least if you want to look at the bright side here, Jets fans, he was, he did have a 100% completion percentage, just that he threw more passes to the other team. <laughs> so, oh, that was one of the worst starts I've seen to a game, quite frankly. And right now he has 468 yards, five, two touchdowns, and five interceptions on the season through the air. So things aren't looking good for either quarterback, but who is performing worse at this point in time? Of course, I mean, I'll, I'll 
I'll put a, a, a statement here before I get into this. First off, um, in any way, are these games really indicative of the careers that either quarterback is going to have? We can't expect rookie quarterbacks, no matter how high of a prospect they are, no matter how good they seemed in college, we have to give rookie quarterbacks time. We can't expect them to be fantastic all-stars as soon as, as they get into the first NFL action. It, they're still really early in their careers, really young stuff, don't have the best supporting cast. Um, one doesn't have a, a, a good head coach. And so we have to give them time to develop. I will preface this with we have to give these quarterbacks time to develop. But at the same time, going for what we've seen, it's not looking good at this point. Zach Wilson, in my opinion, is still the worst quarterback of the two, but it's a really, really slim margin. I mean, uh, Trevor Lawrence's poor play isn't being talked about nearly as much as it should, and he should be in the conversation more in Zach Wilson less of the worst quarterback performance so far of these rookies. But it's a really close competition. I would say Zach Wilson is the worst quarterback. I would also argue that he has the worst supporting cast, though. Corey Davis, uh, Mims, and Braxton Berrios have not done much this year. And I would easily say that Jones Jr., Chenault, and, and um, Chark are the better talent, are the better trio at the receiver position. Right now, the Jets are averaging about 100 rushing yards a game. Jacks are averaging just 75, though. And that's a really important stat, especially for these rookie quarterbacks, especially for the young guys trying to get trying to get acclimated to the NFL. Because there's two really good things for... Uh, the two most important things for a rookie quarterback is an offensive line and a run game. The run game takes pressure off of them. They don't have to pass the ball as much for as far and be as good through the air if you could depend on the run game. Also, if you don't have a good run game, that means th these teams don't have to stack the boxes. They can run more uh, exotic um, coverages against these quarterbacks, and obviously it's hard to read, harder to perform there. If you have a good running game, they have to load the box up a little more. That opens up a little more space for these passing windows. You can read the coverage a little better, probably play a little bit more man than zone, or at least it's a little more obvious of what they're running there. So it's a running game is fantastic for a uh, any quarterback, but especially a rookie quarterback here. And speaking about the offensive line, though, Zach Wilson's been sacked 10 times in two games. I know I'm not great at math either, like a, like a lot of you might be, that's five sacks a game. He's on his ass, and that's not even talking about pressures or rushes or knockdowns. That's just sacks compared to Trevor Lawrence's two sacks he's taken on the season. A lot better margin there. Also, but then another kind of bouncing point is Zach Wilson has a better head coach. Now he's not offensive-minded coach, so you can't put too much of, you can't put uh, too much of the blame on Rob Sala. Still a fantastic coach. He's obviously a defensive-minded guy. He was the best, one of the best defensive coordinators in the league last year with the, with the 49ers. And if you're Trevor Lawrence, you're kind of stuck with Urban Meyer, who is the most overrated coach in the league, one of the worst hirings of the offseason, and a guy that probably won't make it past the bye week. Like I said last week, they'll be 0-7 going to the bye week, and Urban Meyer will be looking for a job at USC. When um, Eric Bayami eventually he's not going to be taking the USC job because he's going to be going on over to the Chicago Bears once the Bears finally fired Matt Nagy. That is the statement. That is my statement, and that is my official prediction here. And so, mark it down. I've said it on Twitter. This is what they should do, and this is what's going to happen. So Zach Wilson, so far, he is the worst quarterback. He needs to throw more. It helps that that Trevor Lawrence is throwing two more touchdowns than he has. But also, it, it it's just, I, I guess it's just not a good start for either guy, though. That's, I think that's very sa safe to say at this point. And also, in, in terms of strength of schedule, the Jets have now faced off against the Panthers and the Patriots, two pretty formidable defenses. Um, and the Jets, or excuse me, the Jags have faced off, of, faced off against the Texans and the Broncos, I mean, both the, the Patriots and the, and the Broncos are hard matchups for these quarterbacks, and both Bill Belichick and Vic Fangio are historically great against rookie quarterbacks. Um, so it's it was a tough 
it was just, in general, a tough week two for either guy there. Now, my second loser of the week is going to be the New York Giants. And this is not the, uh, the last time they're going to show up in this show. Stay till the end and you'll find out why. But the New York Giants have now started 0-2 every year since 2017. And this is the eighth time in the last nine years that they've started 0-2. And let's not even talk about the record since that infamous boat picture. Oh, Together Blue um, is a different meaning with the Giants because they're just all sad and I don't blame him. At least you got Daniel Jones, who's a better quarterback than a lot of people give him credit for. Extremely athletic, um, especially for a white guy running run the uh, football there, man. He looks great. The only problem is uh, if he could stop fumbling the damn ball, he would be a way, way better quarterback. And now my last loser of the week is going to be not Josh Allen, but Josh Allen's fantasy football owners. Because... You look at the Bills game, especially in week two. You look at the Bills. Um, they beat the Dolphins 35-0. to You expect a quarterback, oh, he probably put up pretty good numbers this game then. No, uh, 180 yards, a couple touchdowns, and interception is what Josh Allen was able to muster. And he now has 16 points in either of his first two games. And if you drafted Josh Allen, probably draft him early. I would say probably around the fourth, fifth, maybe sixth round there if you were lucky. Uh, quarterback taking that early has to be doing more than 60 points a game. So another time here. And uh, right now, in, to in terms of total points scored on the season through the first two weeks, he's the 19th ranked quarterback. It's not good. Feel bad for your fantasy owners. That's why I waited to draft a quarterback. But then I get stuck with Ryan Tannehill, who looked good preseason. But now uh, it looks awful. So we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Might have to get Teddy Bridgewater going on my team, given the way that the Broncos offense is looking. They played the Jets, and that screams trap game. But, uh, hey, fingers crossed for that one, of course. But those are my biggest winners and losers. We'd love to know what you guys have to say. Sound off in the comments or hit us up on our socials, which, of course, Twitter, at 4th Long Radio, Instagram, at 4th and Long Radio. Of course, you can find all of our stuff over at the 4th and Long .com. Um, And for NFL specifics, that's the fourth long.com slash NFL. But we're going to get moving on into our next segment here, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, like we, what we had last week, I mean, we got to love some overreactions. It's not the preseason anymore. It's not the week one, but it's week two, damn it. It's still early, and we can still overreact to anything I see on my televisions, on my computers, on my phones, on my tablets, because I've got games on everything. Because... I am obsessed and I have a problem. Let's not, talk, let's not talk about that now. Let's talk about possible overreactions. Are they overreactions or are they not? We're going to take a look at them. And the first one that we got on deck for you guys today is that the rebuild in Carolina is over already. Now, they've been rebuilding probably since around 2018. Their last playoff appearance was in 2017. Um, you can say that the rebuild probably officially started close to 2019. So there's still about two, three years into this thing, which isn't very long, admittedly. It's not very long. They just uh, barely brought in, it feels like, and they just barely brought in Matt Rule as their head coach. And he's already made one hell of a turnaround. And this is a talented team, too, between CMC, DJ Moore, um, Roby Anderson. They've all gone off to a solid start. That defense has looked way better than I thought. They've only given up 10 and a half points a game. And Sam Darnold is seeing a career reemergence there in in Carolina, which is on a, on a just real note. I'm I'm happy for Sam Darnold. I'm really happy that he's getting he's gotten this chance in Carolina. When they traded I, I um in when they traded him in summer, I think it was June. Um I was, I, I was, yeah, I think May or June, actually. It, it was sometime around there. But I was really happy for the guy because Carolina was a good spot for him. He, he's surrounded by more talent. And Christian McCaffrey, in his, by himself, has more talent than he, what he ever had with the Jets team. And he has a legitimate head coach now. It's no Adam Gase BS. And he's just looking good. He's looking like a good quarterback. He's looking like a smart quarterback. He's looking like an athlete there. And I feel like he has to be a whole hell of a lot happier 
And so I love to see what Sam Darnold is doing right there in Carolina. And so, is this an overreaction? I would say yes. Are the Panthers really close to being done already? I would also say yes. So although they're still working on the rebuilds, they still have a little bit of a ways to go to be contenders again. I, there are going to be playoff contenders next year and Super Bowl contenders if the, if the way things keep going within the next five. So this Panthers team might be good again. Of course, not only do you have to trust the process, but uh, to bring you what the Carolina Panthers like to do, just got to keep pounding with this one. Next statement I want to bring you is that the Colts, the Indianapolis Colts, should be hitting the panic button just two weeks into the season. Now they're 0-2 after being handled at home by the Seahawks in week one. And now the Rams go on the road to uh, Lucas Oil Stadium. And they edge out the Colts there as well. They win by three points there in, the, in, in a very well-played game. But the problem is that the Colts thought that, I mean, everyone expected the Colts to have like this top five defense and it, it the in the worst probably like top six seven you know they're supposed to have this really solid defense led by Darius Slater there in the middle um DeForest Buckner there on the on the front seven but they've given up 27 and a half points per game now that's been against two good offenses one with Russell Wilson Chris Carson combo of Lockett and Metcalf and then they're going against Cooper Cup and Robert Woods, a very good duo, a good run game. And then Matt Stafford, who's having the time of his life in L.A. And since he's finally been able to escape the, the prison bars that is Detroit and the place where players go to die and crews go to, to end early, which is Detroit. But that doesn't excuse 25 and a half points a game. This defense has to play better if this Colts team wants to make the playoffs. Carson Wentz as well. Likely out two sprained ankles. Then you got Jacob Eason set to make his first career start, who on five attempts in his replacement of, of Wentz against um, against the Rams, one interception on five attempts. Not great stuff there. And, it, and now the they're going against a team like I like to say one of my winners is the Tennessee Titans, who look looked really good against the Seahawks. That offense is really starting to turn. It is what it looks like. And with a defense that could be good, oh man. And, and your competition in that division, if you want to win the division, you're going to have to go through the Titans. It's not looking good right now. This looks like a team that can be eaten alive on Sunday. Now, I'll probably go on to, to eat my words there um, because I always jinx teams, but this team needs to get together. Their offense is not there. Jonathan Taylor has to do better as well. The offensive line is good, but not great at the moment. Uh, if I'm a Colts fan, I am worried. I'm genuinely worried already at this point in the season. I don't know if you read the, the, that alarm yet, but damn, if you if you lay a stinker this Sunday, you're, it's going to be DEFCON, DEFCON 2 there in Indianapolis. It, it, the season is already going to be in trouble if they go down 0-3, especially depending on how the game goes as well. They, if, especially if they lose by you know multiple scores, it's not going to be good. It's going to be, it, it's going to be real bad there in Indy. Now the last statement that I bring you guys is one that I'm sure <laughs> I'm just going to say this is not an overreaction. That I'd have to say a lot more than this for it to be an overreaction and. I hope that all of you agree with me on this statement that the um, the NFL taunting rule is awful. It needs to go. It should have never been put in place, and it's one of the worst things that ever happened to football. And if you don't agree with that statement, get your head checked because I don't know what you're watching here. Get your eyes checked. Uh, take off the blindfold. Take off the sunglasses that you wear inside the house because this rule is it's abysmal. It's ruining football. We said, I think it was like 11 taunting penalties last week. It was like the first and the most since like 2000, 2002 or something like that. And we're getting people getting penalized for the most ticky tack BS things you've ever seen. But then on the other end, you got Lamar Jackson, like I said earlier, doing a front flip into the end zone, but that's totally fine. 
Oh, damn it. Then now you've got the FLPA tweeting about this and how they hit. And they point out the great thing that there's 11 people on the on that NFL Rules Committee that, that uh, made this rule. There's only one representative from the NFLPA that's on there. That's awful. It should at least be like 6'5". At least. I mean, it, 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 or it at least have like a few guys there from the NFLPA represent because this rule is, is so bad. I can't even put into words on how bad this is. This is ruining football. This is costing people games. You can't even. Oh my. Oh my. I, I'm I'm gonna gonna burst. But I mean, heaven forbid that a player who is a professional in the greatest game on in, in the history of the of the world. There's these guys, some huge, larger than life athletes, men that are that just have these insane testosterone levels. The adrenaline levels, the excitement, the energy is pumping. You make a big tap, you make a big play. And, and and cool, great. I go ahead and I celebrate with my team. Even that could be too much sometimes. But I say one thing, that the NFL at this point, I can't say anything to other team, which which is, is stupid. But the NFL at this point, they are more worried about a player being rude to someone on the other team. They're more worried about someone being rude, saying some mean things, hurting some feelings, than they are about actual problems in the league, like this awful, like 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 the really really bad, um, roughing the passer rules, like the inconsistent officiating across the board, like bad PI calls, inconsistent calls, and you got the the, the, the replays not doing their job. You got the replay officials not doing their job because you'll have evidence. Like Julio Jones, that was a touchdown in the back of the end zone there. But no, I guess not. We're not worried about, the NFL is not worried about actual problems with the league. They're worried about people trying not to hurt the other team's feelings. Get out of here. Stop it. Hurry up and fire Roger Goodell and get his senile ass out of there and put Peyton Manning in charge. Get some real leadership, man. I, I hope I hope you guys. Um, I guess maybe not get work it is as worked up as I do because it's not good for the blood pressure now. Uh, but I hope you you're genuinely outraged about this as well because you should be. This is a joke, and we shouldn't have to deal with this as fans. The players shouldn't have to deal with this. The head, the head coaches and teams shouldn't have to deal with this. Fix it. But I guess, man, I guess might as well even get to my statement about what this was. My statement was that the taunting rule in the NFL is worse than the targeting rule in college. One of my other things I could totally rant about, you know, the thing where, oh man, if you, if you, you know, barely graze a guy in the head with part of your shoulder, your arm, maybe a little bit of your helmet on accident, you get ejected from a game and suspended for the next half of, of your next game. God, that's such a bad rule. And this taunting rule is somehow worse than it. And the game is now worse for having both of these. The two worst parts about football, collegiate and professional, is taunting and targeting. The two T's that can go right to hell. I hate them. I'm sick of it. But it's never going to change because the NFL doesn't care what we have to say. The uh, NCAA and their rules committee is a bunch of dumbasses that don't know what they're doing. So, as fans, we're just left here to suffer. As players, we're just left here to suffer. Is what it is, right? Oh, I hate it. I hate it so much. But let me, let me get my heart rate down. Let me get my blood pressure down. I'm, in fact, I'm going to even take a sip of water real quick here. As, as all you guys should too, because hydration is good. They're, they're at home. Let's go ahead, take a sip of water if, if you got one next to you. If not, go ahead, pause this. Go go to the kitchen. Go to the bathroom sink. Go fill up a cup of water there, and, and come on back when we're hydrated because we're all we're all healthy here, and uh, we all gotta gotta watch uh, our blood pressure, especially when we're talking about stuff like this. And uh, be hydrated. I mean, I guess that doesn't really do much for your blood pressure, but oh, we're just promoting good health around here. 
um, because I need you guys to, to, to live as long as possible and to be healthy as long as possible so you can keep on listening to the show. <laughs> oh, I love all you guys that listen to this and then uh, put up with my commentary here. But a couple things left, of course, i uh, got a couple things I want to talk about here uh, before we get into our predictions and week three power rankings. And of course, the Nene of the week. And the first thing is that, uh, like I was saying in the beginning, Raiders and Broncos, 2-0, leading, they're tied for first in the AFC West, ahead of the Chargers, ahead of the Chiefs. Are they contenders or are they pretenders? And if you want to take a statistical break down the both teams right now, let's take a look at points per game. The Raiders are putting up an average of 29, the Broncos are putting up 25. Points allowed per game, the Raiders are putting up 22 to the Broncos, 13. Average offensive yards per game, the Raiders are putting up 475 to the Broncos, 426. Whereas the Raiders are giving up an average of 380 to the Broncos, 260. So if you take a look at that, Raiders, better offense, Broncos, better defense. And we can't be too surprised about that because the Broncos had a lot of questions, especially at the quarterback position coming into the season. The Raiders, I guess they had questions at the quarterback position, but a lot more of their questions came at the linebacker unit and the defensive secondary unit. And so it, it's not surprising to, to see these stats play out in the way that they are. The pass rushes have been pretty comparable here. I mean, Von Miller is, is returning to form um, and sucks that Bradley Chubb is out. He's going to be missing about a couple months here with uh, um, ankle surgery. And they just lost a huge kid from linebacker in Josie Jewell um, with a torn pec. So he's out for the season. So those are two devastating injuries there. Uh, but with the Raiders, if you want to talk about a guy, I mean, a guy that's really put himself into contention for a defensive player of the year, he might, he's definitely one of the top guys there. It still might be Chandler Jones for for those five sacks he put up in week one, but a guy that you have to talk about when you're talking about the, the least and best defensive players, especially um, edge rushers, is Max Crosby. That guy has been phenomenal so far this year, and he's been the head guy of that team, and the Raiders needed something like this. The Raiders needed a guy that they could look towards on defense. They, the Raiders, um, I mean, they haven't really had a star for a while now. They haven't had a star, especially on, on, on defense. Max Crosby is a star. So this is really, really positive news if you're a Las Vegas Raiders fan and that you're seeing this as well. The schedule, though, that's where things are a little different here. Uh, the Raiders have played a better schedule so far. They've played the Ravens and the Steelers, who are now a combined 2-2. Two and two. Each team is 1-1. One and one. The Ra- I mean, the Raiders probably shouldn't have won that game on Monday night, but they did. So, they did. And then the Steelers are an aging team with a god-awful quarterback with a, a bad elbow um, from who knows what. And uh, he didn't lose a weight, like he said. And that, that TB12 die for Ben Roethlisberger was a lie, uh, apparently. Um, so, the Raiders have that, but... All those Ravens, a little disappointing, especially at least in week one. The Steelers, an aging team on the decline, nothing really compared to who the Broncos have played, and that's the New York Giants and the Jacksonville Jaguars. Of course, two teams that are 0-2, two teams with bad head coaches, two teams with young quarterbacks that haven't been able to get it together yet, two teams with um, with off and some offensive line issues, two teams that haven't been able to run the ball very effectively, and two teams with defenses. I mean, the Giants defense are way better than the Jags, but uh, underperforming at the least. And so... You got that going on for you. If you take a look at the talent, the Raiders actually have some real talent, at least on the offense side of the football. Henry Ruggs is doing a little better here. Josh Jacobs can be good. Kenyon Drake has has um, been um, he's been fine this year. Um, Darren Waller, arguably the most dynamic, um, at least second most dynamic tight end in the league. Not uh, uh, Travis Kelsey at this point. And, Almost, I mean, Gronk is almost up with them, at least in touchdowns, which is crazy. But um, Darren Waller is a big tight end that could actually take the, the roof off a of defense there. And when Hunter Renfro isn't getting cheap shot away from the play, he's a solo player there as well. I have no idea how the Ravens avoid the fines for that. That was some BS, if you ask me. And I hate the Raiders. I hate the Raiders. I'm a huge Broncos fan. We have to hate the Raiders. It's just, it's just what we do. It's in our blood. It's in our nature. It's in our DNA. 
But even I was was real annoyed with what was going on with Hunter Renfro there. It that was trash. That was trash. And so with this, the Raiders are the more legitimate team at the moment, uh, given who they played and how they played them. But they have to be worried about that that points per game uh, that that points per game that they've given up there. The Broncos are sitting pretty with with a solid mark of thirteen, and. Ultimately, you take who the schedule makers give you. You can't. You don't pick your schedule. You just have to go with what they have. The Raiders in Week Three will be taking on the Dolphins, and the Broncos will be taking on the Jets. Two teams that are zero and two, and both these teams. I mean, they both very well could be trap games because you never know with the, the if the Dolphins decide to be good. You never want to underestimate the Jets, even though they're the second worst team in New Jersey. Um, you got you got to play careful, but these are two very winnable games, and then after that, I mean, if everything goes as a plan planned, both teams are going to be three zero. Then the Broncos get their first real challenge of the season, Week Four against the Ravens at home, and the Raiders go on and take the Chargers. Then of course after that, um, the I think was it then the Broncos will be taking on the Steelers, another team that the Raiders have played. The Raiders will be taking on the Bears. And then, so and then in week six, we actually get the first matchup between the Raiders and Broncos, which is going to be a huge proof of game. Um, good chance that both team ends up, say, um, you know, three and two, four and one. I think those are very um, doable records there. Um, hell, so if something happens, they might even be both even be five and zero. Oh. I say the Raiders have a better chance of being five and zero oh than the Broncos do, um, but I think. If the, if the AFC West comes down to the Broncos and Raiders, I will not know what to do with my life. Um, I think all my analysis will go down the window. I might not be able to even talk about football again just because of how off that might be. Of course, that goes a lot for the other media members um, here that talk about the NFL. But right now, the Broncos and Raiders, I, I believe they're both very talented teams. They're both real teams here. They both can contend for the plus. They're both it, it, it can look around that nine, eight, ten, and seven, possibly eleven and six record as well. The Raiders are the more legit team at the point at, at this point in the year, but some good matchups coming up, and so this is definitely something that can change within the next few weeks alone. And then the second thing I want to talk about, I don't know who was talking about specifically. But I saw some people, whether it be on Twitter or the other media sites and, and stuff like that, saying that the Bucks are the best team in the league and they're head and shoulders above the competition. I'm not too sure about that. I think that's a really knee-jerk reaction to what we've, what we've seen from the Bucks in the, in the first two weeks. And, you, and, I, and Tom Brady, he's looked great. I mean, nine touchdowns to, to one interception, that, that's fantastic. His connection there with Gronk, is still strong. I think they have like a what, 101, 102 touchdowns. Um, is is a duo now? Gronk. I mean, he's probably one of my best pickups in fantasy. I got him late round, and he's put up four touchdowns to the leading tight end score in the league right now. He's been been real solid. I'm happy with that, or at least um, most uh, touchdowns of any tight end in the league at this point. But are they really that much better than everyone else? Because I mean, you have an MVP candidate, Tom Brady, of course. So you got that going for you. They're first in the league in average points and score. They're at 39 and a half. The team behind them is the Cardinals at 36. So about three and a half points difference there. But at the same time, they're giving up a whopping 27 points per game. And that's near the bottom of the pack of the league. 27 points per game is not sustainable. Even, I mean, unless maybe if the Chiefs are a couple seasons ago. But even, even that would be tough to keep up. And the offensive talent has been good, but not great. Leonard Fournette has been good, but not great. Chris Godwin is the leading receiver on this team in terms of yardage, and he's 17th in the league in receiving yards and 9th in the league in touchdowns. He has a couple of those. Mike Evans only has two touchdowns on the season, of course, tied for ninth with right there with Chris Godwin, but has less than 100 yards receiving on the year. Gronk has been their biggest threat. Four touchdowns, 129 yards so far. How long is that going to last, though? I mean, we keep asking the same question with Tom Brady, so I guess it's, he's going to last forever, too. But eventually, that's going to stop at one point, and you're going to have to look elsewhere to your Antonio Browns, 
to your Mike Evans, to your Chris Godwins, guys that you're paying a lot, well, maybe not at least not Antonio Brown, but Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, two guys you're paying a lot of money. You have to get them a little more involved in the offense, or they have to step up themselves in this amazing defense, in this amazing pass rush that, that we saw in the Super Bowl last year. The pass rush that won them the Super Bowl last year is not Tom Brady. Tom Brady should not have been MVP, okay? That that goes to Levante David. He should have been Super Bowl MVP. At the least, you know, Shaq Barrett, someone like that. But this amazing pass rush, they have two sacks on the season. They have two sacks, and they've been going up against the Dallas Cowboys, who have a pretty good offense line, admittedly, and the Atlanta Falcons, who do not have the best of offensive lines. And now their, their secondary is injured, and they're losing bodies there, and also and already not very deep is secondary. You know, I mean, they're looking for Richard Sherman for help right now. That's not a good sign. And you have to take a look. I mean, they put up the points. But they put the points against two poor defenses in the Cowboys and the Falcons. And they've given up 27 points per game to a Cowboys offense that, that can be good, can be bad. Normally, it's pretty good. Dak, Dak Prescott, when he's on, he's on. Um, but, of course, they only have that passing game. Their running game isn't very good. And then the Falcons put up uh, enough points here to to kind of make you um, at least like somewhat. I I don't know. I'm, I'm, I might be being a bit harsh with that one. Um, to, I I guess it wouldn't scratch your head that one. Uh, they put up twenty five. Put up twenty five. It's it's not great. You can't be giving twenty five to the Falcons, man. It, it, especially if you're trying to be head and shoulders the best team in the league. So. I'll push. I'm pushing back on this narrative. The, the the Bucks may be the best team in the league at this point, but it's very close. They're not pulling away from it at all. There's a lot of holes. There's a lot of flaws in this team, especially they're on what's in their their bread and butter is supposed to be that defense. But there's a lot of holes, not a lot of flaws, and it's a long season, and they're already getting beat up. Of course, it's a long season, so they can go ahead and, and start getting things together and get going again. But I'm not sold on the Bucks team yet. They might be one of the most overrated teams in the league at this point, as a matter of fact. And that's not calling them bad. It's just calling them overrated. Like what Alex says with Chase Young. Um, he's not bad. Well, actually, he kind of he kind of doesn't like Chase Young. But bad, bad example. But he's not bad. But they could be overrated. Those are two different things. You got to you gotta find the distinction between those two. The Bucks. I mean, we'll see when we get to the power rankings. They're one of the best teams in the league. But like I said, are they head and shoulders above the competition? No, they're not. No, they're not. Can they be? Yes. Can they also drop below? Yes. We'll just have to wait and see with them. And before we get into our power rank, just want to take a look and run through week three of the NFL season, give you my predictions here. Of course, had a little bit better of a week last week, uh, way better than week one. That's for damn sure. But let's go ahead and see if we can keep, keep things on the uptick in, in our week three predictions here. The first game, we got the Panthers and the Texans. I'm going with the Panthers all the way on this one, especially with Tarod Taylor being out for this. Ooh, it's not looking good for you Houston fans. Uh, best week of the year might be week one. Um, next game is the Chargers and the Chiefs, and this is going to be a, a tough game. I do like the Chiefs bounce back at home. I just don't think the Chiefs lose lose back to back games. That's a very hard thing, um, like to do, especially with how much talent they have on that team. Next one is the Cardinals and Jaguars. And if I told you the Jaguars, I'd be lying. Yeah, I'm taking Cardinals all the way on this one. Same thing with the Browns. It's going to be a bit of a closer game here than I think it, what a lot of people can be and really what it should be. But I'll take the Browns over the Bears. Washington football team and the Bills. Washington had a little bit of trouble against the New York Giants. The Bills look really good against the Dolphins. I think this is a close and well-played game, but I'll take the Bills here. Colts and Titans, especially if Jacob Eaton's starting quarterback, I'm taking the Titans, and it should probably be a multiple score game here. Saints and Patriots. This is a tough one for me. This, this basis, the Saints look great in week one. Patriots look real solid in week two. Saints did not look great in week two. Patriots looked all right in week one. In New England, I will take I'll take the Saints on this one. 
I'm taking the Saints, but this is one of my, my hardest games of the week. Next one, we got the Falcons and the Giants. I'll take the Giants on this one. Don't trust, don't trust the Falcons, and I think the, the Giants can finally put together a good game here. Bengals and Steelers, and as long as Joe Burrow doesn't repeat what he did last week, I'll take the Bengals in this one. Ravens and Lions, I'd be lying if I told you that it wasn't the Ravens. Um, Jets and Broncos, oh god, especially as a Broncos fan. Fun news, I get to flex on all of you, I am actually going to this game, and so I am super excited about that. Hopefully I'll be getting some good footage from you guys from the stadium, from the game. Maybe do a little vlogging, a little vlogging there. Oh, I could be one of those people. I guess we'll have to wait and see, but uh, um, if they lose this game, the, I'll be near the top of the stadium because that's the only place where you can get tickets that aren't crazy expensive. Um, yeah, I might have to take a mile high jump if they lose to the Jets, but I'll take the Broncos here. <laughs> uh, Rangers and Dolphins, another trap game here. Remember the last time that the Dolphins played in Las Vegas, Ryan Fitzmagic got his face mask sn uh, just snagged. But he threw a pit, uh, he threw a bomb uh, to deep ball, and that's up the um, them for the win there. So I'll take the Raiders. I'm I'm super unsure about where the Dolphins are at this point, especially with the injury issues with Tua. There, Rams and Bucks. Now I think this is this is going to be my game of the week, and this is a big proof of game for either team. It's in SoFi. I'll take the home team here. I'll take the Rams over the Bucks. Next game, we got the Seahawks and the Vikings. And of course, this is a very winnable game for the Seahawks. They always love giving their fans heart attacks, though. Remember the last time that they played the Vikings? It was way too close than what it should have been. I'll take the Seahawks, and it, things aren't looking good for the Vikings at this point in the season. Packers Niners. Now, this is another game I'm, I'm really interested in here. It's it's in San, uh, technically it's in Santa Clara, not not in San Francisco. Uh, given how the Packers looked on Monday against the Lions, and how the Niners looked against the Lions, going off of, that's what we have in Week One to, to go off and to, to base this off of. I'll, I'll take the Packers. I'll take the Packers on the road. And the last game of the week is going to be the Eagles and the Cowboys, a fun rivalry one. I'll take the Cowboys. I don't think the Eagles' uh, offense can keep up with the Cowboys' scoring. I don't think the Eagles' defense is good enough to hold back the Cowboys' offense. Um, we'll see how the Cowboys' defense performs against that Philadelphia defense. So I think that's going to be one of the, big, the biggest questions of the game. But a couple things left here, of course, in the name of the week. But first off, week three power rankings before we cap this sucker up. Going from unranked to the fifth best team here, I have the San Francisco 49ers. They had a scary but good performance against the Lions in week one. Put up a lot of points there. And they, they go, they had this offensive showcase in week one. Then they have their defensive showcase there in week two. They are dealing with some injuries there. But given what we've seen from play, I'll put them up here at five. The Cardinals have moved up from five. Um, they now are up in number four here, and a team has dropped it's after losing to the Ravens on Monday night. I'm having the Chiefs drop down to number three. They drop a couple spots there. The Rams, they move up to one, or uh, up one to, to two. And then, of course, the last team there is going to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And like I said, I mean, now, and of course, we have the Saints dropping out the top five from, from last week. Like I said, the, the Bucs, they're all going through. They're currently the best team in the league right now. But like I was saying, it's very close. The Rams are right there. And whoever wins this game is going to be the clear best team in the league, at least currently. I'm, I'm so, so excited for that one. That's going to be a damn good game, man. Man, I uh, really should have been Sunday Night Football, but we get the Packers and Irons, which isn't bad. Much rather than have Flex Bucks Rams to Sunday night. And there you go. 5-1. to one. Niners, Cardinals, Chiefs, Rams, Bucks, and Chiefs drop a couple. Bucks, Rams, and Cardinals all move up one. And the Niners go from unranked to five with the Saints dropping out. And to cap things off here, ladies and gentlemen, of course, what other way do we cap this thing off? And what other way do we end things and, and send you on your way? Then, 
with the Nene of the week. And this goes to a, a heartfelt message to, to my guys over there at um, Big Blue Avenue. Um, and it's because, uh, I mean, great show with them uh, preseason uh, before week one, uh, previewing that Broncos Giants game. Uh, and they got another tough one. They should have won on Thursday night, but Dexter Lawrence, apparently, at least to the refs, jumped off sides when the Washington football team, they missed that field goal, they got to re-kick it, and then they made it. It was a very close play on the field and watching it live, and then looking at the film afterward, Dexter Lawrence moved when the ball moved. That was just a good play. He wasn't off sides. I don't think it was off sides. And the NFL confirmed, not only confirmed their call, and... Oh man, that but Nene of the week has to go to the Giants because they should have won. They should move to one and one. They should have uh, continued uh, to beat the Washington Football Team, but they get called for a BS offsides penalty. That's the way the cookie crumbles. And another problem for the NFL to accept, uh, to to look take a look at instead of taking a look at their taunting penalty and enforcing that. No oh boy, but. I've already went through that enough. But ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning into this one. NFL Week 2 Breakdown. A lot of great stuff to talk about. We'd love to hear all your comments here. Whether your thoughts on the Bucks, your thoughts on the Broncos and Raiders, thoughts on the power rankings here, or what your game of the week is going to be in Week 3. But of course, we've got a lot of stuff coming out of the show. Like I said, we got a big interview that just came out last week. Um, with lean, mean, undefeated MMA fighter Jared Melton. He's going on taking the MMA world by storm. Fantastic interview there. Got invited to the gym. It was just an all-around great time and really cool story. And he has a really recent um, addition to his motivation forces. And you'll want to hear that. Of course, for all you non-American football fans, let's talk Australian football. Our grand final preview has dropped. It is live there over at the com slash AFL. The grand final or the Super Bowl, um, essentially Australia Super Bowl, is taking place on uh, technically Saturday morning for us. And we'll be live streaming that. If you want to stop by over on Twitch, uh, our Twitch, of course, is twitch.tv forward slash fourth and long radio. We'll be live around, was it 5 o'clock Eastern for that one? It's not bright and early. It's going to be a great time. It better be a good game. But go ahead. Come on, come on, join us here. And it's going to be a blast. But keep an eye out for all this stuff. Keep an eye out for some NFL stuff I'll be putting on. Um, and since I'll be at the Broncos game here on Sunday, I'll also be at the Rockies game. Take a place at, take a look at the beautiful Coors Field. I mean, I'm, I grew up A's fan. I've been to that, that, that. Hole that is nothing but weed, concrete, and uh, and gum. That that's known as the Oakland Coliseum. So I'll be able to go to a real baseball season finally. So I'm super excited about that. So keep an eye out for that stuff, guys. Of course, you can find everything at the fourth and long .com. And before we sign off, just gotta say a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. Of course, the biggest and best supporter there is Ray Rodriguez. Of course, um, and for all your card collecting needs, for all you card fans, go on over to Instagram, follow at the Big Bat Box. And also shout out to Ryan Watson and Neil Wiley for their continuous contributions to the channel. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for sticking here to the end. It's always a pleasure. I can't wait to see all of you next time when we break down week three of the NFL season. Hopefully, come home with the Broncos dub. If not. Uh, I'll be crying. I'll be crying on that show. <laughs>